Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. I am back to YouTube after being absent for a long time. Lots of things were happening. We suffered through an immense snowstorm here and had to dig ourselves out. That was a while back and it's just taken me a while to get back to my social media accounts and activities. Those of you who are regular subscribers and followers of my channel on YouTube and my social media accounts and Patreon and Facebook will be aware of my deep, deep love for books. I am truly uh, an, um, an, a, a bibliophile afflicted by what is known as the gentle madness of bibliophilia, the, the perpetual fascination for books resulting in the constant collection of them and they're piling up everywhere. And uh, you may also know that I think it's, yeah, it's my most popular video on my channel is called My Library. There's something like 4,500 plus views. So thank you to everybody out there who's given me all these views. And I decided I would do a follow-up video about my library in which I focus on my rarest books. Um, and those are mainly manuscripts, handwritten books in Arabic and other languages. I also have a collection of what are called lithographs, and most of those are all from the 19th century of the Christian calendar, the Gregorian calendar, or the very early 20th century. I also have a bunch of uh, books, um, well, not a bunch, but a few books which, um, which uh, have been autographed by the authors of those books who I had occasion to know or meet, or even in, in one case, um, I think, yeah, study with. So um, we'd like to, um, you know, look at those books today, and I may also talk a little bit about uh, my love for books and libraries and whatnot. So there's really no uh, particular place that we need to start, but um, I have um, a small number, I think, of, uh, we'll begin with manuscripts. So I have a small number of Arabic manuscripts, and um, they're all of various... Um, topics and genres. So let's start with this big fat book here. You can see this. This is quite a large size. Um, we have a ruler here, but I mean, this is not going to be an exhaustive book where I talk about, you know, the dimensions and so forth. We just like to feature them. So maybe you can come over here and I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of my Arabic manuscripts. What many people do not realize is that... Um, Especially in the case of Arabic books, uh, in modern publishing today, about you know when, when we talk about what are known as kutub at turath or books of the Islamic um, intellectual legacy and heritage, they all originally were in manuscript. Uh, you know, printing uh, the printing press came to the Islamic world. I would say relatively later than it did in Europe, and even then it didn't really catch on too much until much later. Um, and so we really are in the realm of the hand-produced book, and many people don't realize the relationship between modern printed editions and manuscripts. So here we have a book. We'll tell you what it is later, but first just get a feel of this as an object. I mean, this is amazing. If you could actually touch this, you will feel the paper. The paper, um, let's see, let's shine a light on it. You, see, you can see it's kind of glossy. And that's because the paper has been glazed. Uh, glazed oriental paper is how they often um, refer to it. It's been glazed and it's been burnished and it's been polished. And if you, you can touch this, this was all written by hand. Indeed, written by hand with, uh, with a reed pen. So yeah, get a good look at that. Um, here's an example of a reed pen. This is actually a bamboo calligraphy pen. Uh, so you can imagine how difficult it is to produce a work of this kind. And again, the inks would have been handmade inks. And that whole area of Islamic scribal culture and calligraphy is an area that's in, in its own right, as is the making of paper. And then, of course, binding. This is leather. And then, of course, the binding. You can imagine this was sewn together. You know, this is a delicate thing, so I don't want to crack it open. But, you know, you can see that there are places where the book has been sewn together. And you can even see that on the edge, if you look at the binding on the edge here, we can sort of stand it up. You can even put some magnification, I don't know. Let's see. So what is this object? This is actually one of my favorite manuscript books in my manuscript 
collection. And one thing you learn about manuscripts is when you often find in the front matter and the back matter, you know, the pages that that support it at the beginning and the end, they often have ownership notes and like here's a seal of the owner. The seal is really, really smudged. I can't really make it out. Um, and so they often have ownership notes and things like this. So, I mean, we can try and read one. So here, for example, it says, Bismihi ta'ala, in his name, the Most High. Hada mimma uh, malakani rabbi bimannihi wa yumnihi. So in other words, this, in other words, this book is amongst the things which my Lord, <clears throat> uh, through his munificence and his grace, uh, caused me to own. Fi shahar muharram, in the month of Muharram 1314, that's 1314 of the Hijrah. And the name looks like Ali, Ali ibn Musa. So that's um, an ownership note. So really, what is this? You look at the beginning, you have a basmala. And here in red, you can see it says Kitab was zakat. Let's get a bigger magnifier. Kitab was zakat. And you can see there's little uh, uh, other chapter headings. Like here's al fossil, I think. And here is Amma al muqaddimah and here's the introduction. al fasl al rabiq section 4, al fasl al thalith section 3. So what exactly is this? I actually have notes on this book, which I made some time back. But uh, I'll get to that in a second. You can also go to the end and you can see when the person finished writing or copying out the book. So the scribe says, تَمَّ هَذَا الْكَلَامِ بِعُونِ الْمَلِكِ الْعَلَّامِ فِي شَهْرِ جَمَادِ الْأَوَّلِ He says, should be جماد الأولى فِي الْيَوْمِ الْخَامِسِ مِنْهُ مِنْ أَسَّنَةِ التَّاسِعَةِ وَالْعِشْرِينَ بَعْدَ الْمِئَتَيْنِ So this is 1229 Hijra and it was in the um, month of جماد الأولى the fifth in fact اليوم الخامس منه So that's what called a colophon and what this book is, is there was a famous Akhbari jurist named uh, Al-Bahrani, and this is his book. It's Yusuf Al-Bahrani. Yusuf Al-Bahrani died in the year 1186, which corresponds to the year 1772. He wrote the work in 11, uh, it says here 1178, and this was copied, as we said, in 1229. And so if we subtract his death date, which is 1186, we see that it's within 43 years of the death of the author. So this is a really, really good copy. It's not the whole work. Um, oh, the, the book is called Al-Hada'iq al-Nadara. And it's a book of hadiths uh, from the Ahl-Bayt relating to Islamic law. So this is a very nice uh, example of an Islamic manuscript. And all right, uh, right now it's what, 14, what's the year now? 1442 of the Hijra should be in the month of Sha'ban. And so this was copied in 1229. So it's a very old book. So here is another uh, book. This is also leather binding, um, the, your usual sort of various notes. You find all sorts of weird things in, in the front matter. Sometimes people just wrote down little notes, poetry that they like. This is... This is um, uh, some lines of, uh, yes, Persian poetry. You have to check sometimes. It could be Turkish. Some other little notes here and there. There's some kind of an ownership note here. So it looks like that this guy um, acquired this book in um, the month of Dhul Hijjah. That's the last month of the Islamic calendar in the year 1255 of the Hijra. So again, almost 200 years. Now look at this. I mean, there's his notes all over the place all over the place, all sorts of marginalia. Uh, you note here at the top, there's a heading. It says Kitab al-Tahara, the book of ritual purity. If you flip forward, you'll see Kitab al-Jihad. Uh, here's Kitab al-Tijara. Here's Kitab al-Hajj. Right? Kitab al-Sawm, fasting, pilgrimage, trade. So this is a book of law. This is a book of law. Kitab al-Rahn, Kitab al-Wasaya. And it turns out that this is the um, Kitab Shara'i al-Islam, which is a very important uh, work of uh, Islamic law in the Shi'i school. 
and there's a lot of marginalia. So this was probably owned by someone who taught the book or was a student over many, many years. And obviously there were different owners and you see there's even inserts here of um, our equivalent of post-it notes, but they're bound into the book. So this is a beautiful object and uh, you can see, of course, that this is written in a Nusch based handwriting and then you have marginalia in a kind of uh, nastaliq shikasta or what we might call a shikasta nastaliq uh, handwriting. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, let's see if there's anything about the year. No, there's no. Yeah, there's uh, some of the pages are missing, so we don't have a colophon on this one. Here's another book which I <coughs> have. Again, leather binding. This is a lot thinner. This one doesn't open so well. And you can see here in the binding, they have taken a page from some other book because the handwriting is totally different. You can see inside they're very different handwriting. And then you have another thing ripped out from somewhere as a, as a, you know, inside cover paper. Very nice handwriting here. Not so nice here. Here you've got a kofan that's 1233 of the Hijra. And you look at the writing and people who are doodling stuff in the margins. You know, people did things. <laughs> Uh, this one's not in as good a shape, and the writing is not that nice inside, but I remember when I first came upon this book, I acquired all three of these volumes back in 2003 at an um, antique dealer in the, in the United Arab Emirates, and I got them very cheap. So uh, when I opened this book, I immediately realized that this was the kitab, um, uh, it's called Ma'alim. Ma'alim uh, al-Din al-Malad al-Mujtahideen, or also known as Ma'alim al-Usul. It's a book of Shiite usul al-Fiqh. And you can see there are different notes. You're like, this is 1297, 1296. But uh, it's um, missing some pages from the beginning. But uh, since I had studied this book carefully, uh, immediately recognized what it was when I opened it up. And same with this one, the Shra al-Islam. It took me a while to figure out that this was Bahrani's um, Hada'iq, but uh, it's a nice uh, thing which I acquired there. This is um, a very different sort of book. It has a beautiful binding. It has one of these tongues, as they call it, a lisan. So, you know, you can, you know, but obviously over time they warp and things, but this is a very nice leather binding. This is Moroccan, Maghribi. And therefore it is in Maghribi script. I think this is going to be a real treat for the people watching the video. So again, these are kind of falling apart. But let's just jump in the middle. Look at that. Wow, look at that. Carefully open that one up. Now, the person <coughs> who wrote this was a man of tremendous piety. Or maybe this is a funk, a, a convention in the Maghreb, in the uh, North, 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 in North Africa. I don't know. But here you see in Maghribi script, Allahumma salli ala Mawlana Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi, it says here. And you've got that at the top of every page. So he has this um, jumla du'a'iyya in which he invokes uh, benedictions on the Prophet Muhammad and his Ahl Bayt, alayhi salatu wasalam, and the companions, the Sahaba. So you notice that the script is very, very different. This is a Maghribi script. It takes a while to get used to, but um, you can learn to read it, you know. So here's the opening. You can see how the, the ink has leaked through from the pages. This is from the 19th century. I don't have a colophon on this, but that's my guess by the paper. And there's some notes here uh, by the previous owner. That's not my handwriting. In case you're wondering whose writing that is, that was I got this book, inherited this book from one of my teachers, Abdul Jabbar Victor Danner, Rahimahullah, at one time of Indiana University. He is now deceased. That's his handwriting in the green. The pencil is mine. So this is a book that has the letters of Mulay al-Arabi al-Darqawi. And you can see that here. Yeah, this is very hard to read. Okay, so if we try and read this, this is going to be the usual stuff. You know, the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let's try and read this. وَلَا حَوْلُ وَلَا قُوَةِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ وَصَلَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى سَيِّدَنَا وَمَوْلَانَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلِّمْ It says here, Tasliman Kathiran. Now it gets difficult. Ila Yomid Deen Amin Amin Amin. Three times it says Amin. Then it says here Wa Ba'ad 
Fahada. Notice the hada. <clears throat> I don't want to write in this, but that's the fa, and the dot is underneath the fa in Maghrabi script. Then there's a ha. And instead of ha, they have hada with an alif. You know, so it's something like you've got this is the fa, and then he's got some kind of a ha here, and then he goes faha the. You got the dot here, whereas in, you know, and it should be in ma in non Maghribi, it would be like this faha the. <clears throat> Anyhow, so what is it? Wabad faha the asrar tariqa. Etc. رضي الله عنهم تأليف. Okay, تأليف من يقول السلام etc. Where's the name? Um, something will. Ah, قد من الله على العربي يا أبي أحمد الشريف الدرقاوي نزيل القبيلة الزروالية. So this is a book <coughs> which is known in English as the Darqawi Letters. An extract of these were translated by uh, what Titus Burkhart years and years ago. And there's a full translation also available that was done by uh, Abdul Qadir uh, Sufi or Al Murabit or whatever he was calling himself. So this is the book, Asrar al Tariqa fi Madhab al Sufiya by Al Arabi ibn Ahmad al Sharif al Darqawi. Uh, and he lived between 1737 to 1823 or 12, um, 13, 1149 to 1238. And so this is a book of the Sufi letters of Al Darqawi. So I have a lot of really strange books, obviously. I have all sorts of manuscripts and things here. I have some lithographs as well. Uh, I have, uh, I remember I mentioned I had autographed books. So these obviously are not manuscripts, but they are um, precious because of the signature. So this is the famous or the infamous, however you want to see him, Bernard Lewis, who I knew at Princeton. I never took any classes with him, but I had some of his books. And so here he has sign that's the signature of bernard lewis with best wishes bernard lewis here's this famous book the emergence of modern turkey same thing bernard lewis <clears throat> with best wishes bernard lewis then there's the <laughs> bernard student <laughs> michael cook and patricia crone there's michael cook there <laughs> okay this is an interesting book also i knew this guy at princeton uh, michael cook of course yeah i did take classes with him at princeton this is um this is Omar Pound. He's the son of Ezra Pound. And he actually studied Arabic and Persian at, uh, what was it, Cambridge? I think he studied at Cambridge. Let's see, it should say on the back. Oh, McGill. And at the London School of Oriental African Studies. Okay, so it was Savas. Uh, he is currently teaching in the College of Arts. Anyway, he is deceased now. I knew him briefly at Princeton, and he gave me a copy of Arabic and Persian poems. There's for Nizam Adin with best wishes from the author, and then it says Omar Pound. So, yeah, the son of Ezra Pound. Pretty cool. Science and Civilization in Islam, second edition, by the Islamic Text Society, by the famous Sayyid Hussein Nasr. Sayyid Hussein Nasr presents, yeah. Well, he didn't present me with this. I bought this book in, actually, I bought this in Bloomington, Indiana, I remember, at a bookshop called Aurora Books way back in the day, 1989, I think. And this is... His uh, signature in Arabic, he signed it in Cairo, in AUC, uh, American University in Cairo in 1990, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 91. So there's Sayyid Hussein. He says, Huwa, who, you know, he, the name of God. Quddima ila akhil aziz fiddin Sayyid al Fadl Nizam al Deen min hadh al Faqir ila Rabbihi Sayyid Hussein al Qahira. So there you have that. <clears throat> Those are my autographed books. Oh, here's some more. Yeah, this guy, uh, Michael Wolf, he's an American Muslim. He wrote a book on the Hajj some years ago. He, I don't remember. He, he must have come to a lecture, and I probably went. So there's Michael Wolf's signature. When did this go? 1993. Around the same time, he wrote this, 1,000 Roads to Mecca. This is nice travel writing about the Muslim world. So again, here, Michael Wolf. So these are our signed books, autographed books. Let's move these, put them somewhere. Can you take those? Ah. Uh, I have a lot of lithographs. This is my copy of the Shams al-Ma'arif. 
the famous or infamous book of Albuni. I bought this in 1990 in Cairo uh, near the Sayyidina Hussein Mosque. In fact, behind the Sayyidina Hussein Mosque. And this is just a fantastic sort of lithograph, beautiful <coughs> lithographed edition. All sorts of things in it. Should we blur this out? No, we don't need to blur this out. Look, let's see if we can find some. Yeah, here's some famous sort of talismans that he's known for. There's another famous one. There's one really weird shaped one I was looking for. Which um, Sayyid Hussein Nasr, since we're talking, we mentioned him, he, he reproduces in a different form in his um, science and civilization in Islam. Oh, it must be wherever it is. So this is the famous book of Albuni. Yeah, there's some interesting talismans. There's a peacock feather. Gotta have one of those. Okay, so this is my copy of the <clears throat> Shams. Do I have a fascination, long-standing fascination with libraries? <clears throat> also books about libraries. There's this great author, Borges. He has a story called The Library of Babel. Uh, in his fictions. Yeah, so I really like this passage here. Like all men of the library in my younger days, I traveled. I have journeyed in quest of a book, perhaps the catalog of catalogs. That's really the whole story of my life. Um, I've lived all over the world. Wherever I've gone, I've acquired books, and I have built up uh, a, a huge library. Um, so, Dr. Ahmed, you just showed us all of these amazing manuscripts. Yes. And you've you've made a video on your channel called yes. My Library in which you've showed your yes. library. It's your yes. most popular video. Yes. So I would tell you out of all, I would ask you out of all the um institutions of higher learning that you've attended. Oh yes, yes. And have spoken at Oxford, Cambridge, Warburg, you've been yeah. I don't even remember, like Indiana University, Bloomington, all these places. What yeah. what is your favorite library? And you've traveled across the Islamic world as well. What are your favorite libraries? Yes, well, that's that's a marvelous question. Um, uh, again, I'm reminded of that story in um, uh, Borges's collected fictions, known as the Library of Babel, where the protagonist in the story talks about how he has um, gone on, on journeys in quest of books and you know the catalog of catalogs. That's very much been the story of my life as well. Um, I have a perpetual fascination with books. I'm always looking for some kind of a book. I'm always on the lookout for some title or titles. I visit bookstores often. And uh, I actually read a lot of these books, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I A lot of them are works of reference. And some you just buy because you think you might need. Or sometimes you even I've even bought a book that has a, maybe just a single chapter or, or reference, which... Um, you know, I might need for something else in my research work. You, and, and then there's something, you know, you never know. You buy a book and you think, yeah, I might need this a few years from now. And believe it or not, that actually happens. Yeah, I remember as a kid, I would walk around, you know, we lived in Egypt and I would see all these books. And as a kid, I thought you had read all of these books. Yeah, so yeah. So I was yeah. like, I would think, how, how did he read all these books? But I found out later, many of them. You well, some of read. them are for reference. Like, I mean, for example, that's in the case of Jawahir al Kalam. Right. 43 volumes. Uh, I have no plans of reading that from cover to cover. Mm. But if I need to look up anything on Islamic law, anything at all, um, the Shia school in particular, obviously, because it's a Shia text, you will find what you need there. Um, and it's well well, well done. It's cross-referenced to you know other books like the Wasaid of Shia and so on and so forth. So uh, a lot of these books are works of reference. Right. And out of the library, I mean, like, for example, the OED, the Oxford yeah. English Dictionary, is twenty volumes. I don't plan on reading that from cover to cover, but there are words yeah. that you need to look up. <laughs> so, so, you, so what are your favorite libraries then? You know, it's really I, I don't think I've ever met a library I didn't like. Uh, if I and, are there any that have stood out? Yeah, of course, there's ones that stood out. I spent um, many many years of my life in the Princeton University Library which is known as the Firestone Library and so uh, that holds a very special place in my heart and uh, it was very well designed it's open stacks and the desks and so forth my schedule for years used to be that I would uh, be there from usually from noon to midnight until it closed wow. and I would usually take a little break in between 
go and have a coffee or Doing something. Doing what? Just studying and... Yeah, reading, studying, uh, looking things up, working on my dissertation. Sometimes just wandering around. Sometimes you just get tired yeah, of Yeah, I imagine it's huge. It's huge. And so I wondered, uh, there is not a place in the open stacks in the Princeton University Library back in the 1990s, which I have not seen. I've been to like every, I've walked through every single section. Right. And you went, you um, attended around the nine, 90s, yeah, yeah, right? So, yeah. and I remember you went... 92 to 2000. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't know the exact yeah. years, but you went, I think, recently, maybe a year and a half ago. How did the library change? It's changed. Uh, you know, they've moved things. The, the Near East collection has been moved to sea level, which I didn't like. And it's got those horrible. They have these shelves, which which have these. Um, they actually move. They're on tracks. And there's this big kind of a wheel with a handle that you turn. It's almost like a mill wheel, but it's turned at 90, you know, vertically. And then it moves the shelves. And so... You can't easily wander between them, so they put a lot of the stuff down there. That they've changed it around, mm. and they also ruined the catalog. Um, I like the the way things were cataloged at Princeton before. There was a librarian there named his name was something Richardson, and it was called the Richardson system, and so it was cataloged in a certain way. So that uh, the weakness of that system is you have to know the author. So if you know the author or a name by which the author is known in the catalog, then you can find the book. Mm. Now, there was a certain a certain degree of uh, you know idiosyncrasy in the way that they did that. So there's a famous Mu'tazili jurist by the name of Al-Qadi Abdul Jabbar. Well, Al-Qadi Abdul Jabbar was not under Abdul Jabbar. He was under Astarabadi. Mm. And uh, until you figured that out, of course, you could go and look him up. Right either in the computer at that time, or they still had a card catalog. I, for one, like card catalogs. And I think it's just horrible what's happened, that everything is just I think you've made your own, right? I have my own card catalog. Yeah, there's one over there. You can bring me one of those boxes. Yeah, well, bring one of those. It's not complete. You know, this is a never-ending job. This is something you attempted to do maybe a few yeah, years ago. Yeah, I started this a long time ago. And then, here, let me see. So here, this is one of my boxes um, with, uh, with cards. So these are the English ones. So here, for example, under C, Frederick Copleston, A History of Philosophy, Volume 2, Part 1, Medieval Philosophy, Augustine to Bonaventure, Garden City, New York, Image Books, 1962. And that's my handwriting on the card. Wow. So, um, yeah, I like card catalogs. I, I made this all myself, this whole thing here. I've got one for Arabic as well. Uh, but um, then I had a... You know, that was back when I was a student, and then I got a job, and then I left the country, and part of my books were here, and then I was traveling around, and then when I was buying books, I made a, I made a kind of catalog myself on my computer, uh, but it was it was um, what we would call a hand list. Oh, right. <laughs> and I still have that, and then I, had, then I hired somebody to catalog all the books I acquired in Egypt and have a separate, do separate document for that. I mean, one needs time, one needs to sit down and do these things. And in this, I was very much inspired by the example of Radiuddin ibn Ta'us, the great Chi no jurist and, um, um, um. And, and polymath and bibliophile of the Abbasid period. Hmm. Um, I think he died in the 600 and something right. of the Hijra. And, you know what this and he, he had a catalog which survived, you see, because he lived until the end of the Abbasid rule, just before the Mongol destruction, the Mongols destroyed Baghdad. Right. And his book catalog survived. And there's a book about his books by a guy named Itan Kohlberg. Uh, and uh, Itan you know, wrote a whole book on, on Ibn Tawus's library, and it's fascinating. It's one of the most interesting modern books I own, really. Wow, I think I have to read that sometime. Yeah. You were talking about how you tried to catalog your books just now. That reminded me of a story. It's kind of a weird example, but remember I was reading the biography of Che Guevara? Che Guevara. Yeah, yeah. the Cuban revolutionary. And yes, he yes. attempted to, to make a list in his own journal of every book he had read. Yeah. But eventually he stopped because he had just read too many that he couldn't even remember. Yeah. And he would write the author and the publisher right. and everything. Well, in that regard, uh, Ibn Tawus And he again, was very busy, too. Ibn Tawus, is, again, his example is very instructive. He compiled a book called Sa'd al-Su'ud, which was kind of a, another catalog in which he commented on some of the important books in his collection. Oh. And that's also what makes fascinating reading. So, But in terms of all of these libraries, I think, the, 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 if, not my, one of my, if not my favorite, it's certainly one of the strangest libraries in a good way, yani Ajib. Hmm. The Arabic word ajib can mean weird, but it can also mean marvelous that I've ever visited. And that's the library of the Warburg Institute. 
Yeah, you told me about that. That's like one of the only libraries you've seen that has a, a section purely on the Antichrist. This is true. They have a section. It's not that very big. It's just a little shelf and, uh, you know, just a few books. But they also have a section on comets. You know, it's a very weird place. And magic and... I mean, but it's just a remarkable collection. It's, what, it's I think the only library I've been to other than Princeton, Firestone, that has... Um, you know, all three volumes of Otto Neugebauer's book on ancient Babylonian astronomy. Mm. All three volumes. All, all three <laughs> yes, volumes. Just, quite a cool book, actually. Right. <laughs> yeah. So the Warburg I like a lot. Um, the Princeton University manuscript collection is also fantastic. There's some really amazing books there. I'm sure you have a lot of experience in that. Yeah, and I like the Soleimania Library in Istanbul for its manuscript collection as well. I also did research in the Bayezid Darul Kutub in Egypt is not very organized, but fantastic. Still. Where is that? Darul Kutub is, is in Cairo. It's not in Al Azhar. It's located in a place uh, called Babul Luq, mm. but nobody pronounces it like that in Egypt. They say Babul Luq, mm. and um, and there's a, a museum there also in which there's a fantastic collection of astrolabes. In fact, I remember the first time I met Charles Burnett was in Cairo. He's a colleague of mine who's a, a man of great um, erudition and learning and is at the Warburg Institute um, and uh, so we went looking at uh, looking for an astrolabe which mm -hmm. he was interested in and so we went to um, the Dar al Kutub in Babalu and we also went to the um, what do you call it the Museum of Islamic um, Art or whatever it is um, yeah I mean, and there's a lot of uh, um, private libraries which I've seen also which are very interesting Probably the most interesting private library I have ever had the honor of visiting is the private library and collection of the His Highness the Raja of Mahmudabad in Mahmudabad, as well as in his lodgings in Lucknow. Were you just conducting research for something? What were you doing? Well, there? it's kind of a long story, but I was introduced okay, to then. the Raja Sahab uh, by a friend, and then we got to know another, and then I became uh, close to his uh, his. I remember we, we, stayed, son. we stayed there as yeah. well. And uh, anyhow, so I was able to see some of the books. I did some work for him also and uh, made some recommendations for the preservation and cataloging of some of those books, the digitization. Oh, I see. And, um, you know, among my friends, some of my friends who have really fantastic libraries, shout out to Adam Sabra. He has a fantastic collection. More fantastic than this? Well, you know, I mean, there are books, there are libraries, and there are libraries. Um, he's quite a bibliophile as well. Mm. And uh, Adam is an old friend of mine. I think everyone mine. in academia kind of is, right? Well, not everybody. Not everybody? No. I feel like you kind of have to be. I've known Adam since what? Since Casa in Cairo, Center for Arabic Story in the 1990s. And we used to spend, uh, we used to go around and spend most of our stipend buying books all over Cairo. And um, wow. he teaches at Santa Barbara now. He has a fantastic collection of books and is really into editions. He also does critical editions. Uh, another good friend of mine who has an amazing library is my friend Sajad Rizvi in London. Uh, I've been to his house uh, several times and seen he, he has quite a good collection. Of course, Sajad is also um, uh, very prolific on Instagram. <laughs> Taking yeah. pictures of books. Uh, we, can, we can maybe so put his Instagram. Shout out to uh, Adam and Sajad. Hmm? We can maybe put his Instagram in the description. Yeah, yeah, put his Instagram. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, yeah, I'd probably say the Warburg is probably one of the coolest libraries I've been to. I mean, it doesn't look like anything outside. In fact, it's pretty ugly, uh, big, just cube, build, cubicle building. And there's nothing distinguished about the architecture of, of the right. Warburg Institute when you go inside. And again, there's nothing terribly impressive there either. It's just, just metal shelves. But it's just it's good very, content. Very yeah. good content. Unlike Firestone Library, which is very well designed. Yeah, I've seen it, pictures. It looks very, very nice. I mean, Ivy League, it has to Yeah, it's, it's nice. beautiful. The British Library is fantastic. I spent a lot of time in the reading room there in the Oriental collection there. Um, but, you... of course, it's not open stacks. Right. They can't be. Those kind of libraries can't be. Can't allow people free reign. You have to fill out a card or get a book and right. take that. So. so we touched a little bit on cataloging systems, and yes, I yes. think it seems your favorite is the the way Princeton did it, or do they still do it? I, I, they've eliminated that. Now, in the United States, the major li uh, cataloging system Congress. is the Library of Congress. Yeah, we're going to get kind of nerdy here talking about cataloging Even the British systems. use, and then you've got the Dewey Decimal System. 
Yeah, yeah, what is your what's your favorite and like what are the different kinds? I liked and Richardson. This is, you like the Richardson? I liked it because I understood the system. And so I never had to use the catalog after that if I knew the author that I was looking for. Yeah, you I imagine you were there for and there so were, long. And some of the um other graduate students who never mastered the system thought that somehow I had a fantastic knowledge of where all of the books in the library, which was absolutely ridiculous. You just knew the system. I just knew the system. If you know the system and they I mean to be fair, I also they have were, a pretty they, good memory, but yeah. it's not that good. <laughs> Yeah. And you could and and if you're working in a library on a con- consistent basis on a daily basis, you actually get an idea of where things are, especially mm. stuff that you need. And so anytime they acquire a lot of new books and the collection shifts after they shelve them, you would I would notice. Right. So and, uh, this is my other question. And like, I had a good control of the Congress system as well because when I was at Princeton, a lot of all the books acquired before 1980 something hmm. in the Islamic collection were were cataloged according to Richardson. Then after that was Library of Congress, so it was a split system. Yeah, have you been to the Library of Congress? Yeah, I've been to the Library of Congress. It's not one of your favorites, though. Not particularly, no. You, do you not like it because of the system or any particular reason? I have nothing against it. It's just, you know, if you talk about my work, right. it's not exactly up there on the list of, of collections of Islamic works, uh, of, of libraries with Islamic, uh, you know, books and Islamic right. studies. Uh, but it's pretty good. Um, and you said you, you visited libraries in the Islamic world. Do, do they have their own ways of cataloging since the, most of the books are, might be in Arabic? Or... Well, no, there's a good question. Yeah. Some of them I don't have much of a system. Like, I'll tell you, probably the worst um, and most disorganized in terms of, in a system that made no sense whatsoever, is the Shibli Nomani Library in Nadut al in Lucknow. Well, I imagine There's because no, it's also it, in a, It's just numbered by sequence. They sort of have a rough subject um, I imagine also because they're that's, in third world countries and they don't get much funding or time as well. I don't know about that. I, I think that the Nadut al is, is very well bankrolled. And they have plenty oh, of money. Well. I think they just don't have a tradition of, of a modern library science. Um, in contrast to, let's say, Iran, mm. where everything is cataloged according to the Library of Congress system. So I went to the, the Iranian National Library uh, back in the day when Abdul Hussein Hairi was the uh, was the head of the library. That was a fantastic library. In fact, I was there with Sajjad others. It was a mar- marvelous visit we had. So so most of them just sort of follow the Library of Congress or they just invent their own ones? If they or? have a system, they usually follow. It's become like the English language, a kind of default uh, right. <laughs> majoritarian sort of mm. thing. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way. My my teacher, the late Sayyid Jalali, had his own system. And uh, rahimahullah, and what he would do is... <laughs> it only really works for Turath. Because he would assign a number to the book according to... What is to Turath? The, uh, I'm, you know, I don't Turath know. is Islam, works of Islamic intellectual heritage or right. legacy, you know, in Arabic, Persian, what, what have you, Turkish. Okay. So he would assign a number to the book by the death date of the person. <laughs> okay. Okay, so if, if it's, oh, I don't know, um, gosh, what's it? Usul by Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Tusi. So Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Tusi died 460 of the Hijrah. Mm. So it would have the number 460. And then I think, and then I think he would assign um, some letter, right? Depending on the name of, of so are you going to go with Atusi? You know, a lot of people go by Atusi, right? Um, as a nisba, so you you have to have some system. But the admit <laughs> the disadvantage of that is if the author isn't dead, <laughs> you okay. don't have that date. <laughs> so, but it works for Torah because uh, right, yeah. So did you ever try? So you have the so his vast... books were actually cataloged that way. Okay, in Chicago. So you have this vast... And I should say his was okay. one of the best personal libraries I've ever seen. But the last time I went there was like a couple of years before he died. And there was hardly any room in there. There was just enough room for, for us to barely fit in. Right. So I imagine you have this vast collection of books. Of yes. over 20,000 books maybe, if I had to estimate. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Did you ever try and catalog your life? Like when we yeah, yeah. moved here, did you ever try and catalog it according to since the Princeton we have been system? On the, since we have been rather nomadic for the last, you know, so many years, yeah. I've kind of lost track. Otherwise, I had a very good control over where things were. Are you getting better now that we've... Well, now things have sort of settled down, so I have certain things set out here for my work. Did you work. use the Richardson catalog no, system? No, I or? use the Nizamuddin system. You use your own system. Just know where things are. Um, but then sometimes I've misplaced things because of shifting from house to house and oh. I know they're in a box somewhere. So then I have to go and go through all the boxes. Yeah. You know, hopefully if I can just get a big, I mean, when we were preparing can... for this video, you said, let's get this book and you just went down in the garage and immediately found it in like maybe 30 seconds. Yes, of course. Yes. I mean, I, 
It's just a testament. Because even, even in, in the disorder, there is some rough order. Right. And so every time I'm walking in, if I see, oh, this should be there somewhere, I kind of group them like... It's organized chaos, it seems, right? Or is it... You could say something like that, right. yes. Yeah. This next question I have is doesn't really have to do with anything we just talked about, but... I mean, we, we mentioned that... I think you mentioned this book, A Gentle Madness. I can show it to By the By Nicholas uh, Basbanes. Yeah. Basbanes. And he writes about... Well, it says bibliophiles, bibliomanes, and the eternal passion for books. That's right. So you can you can speak for yourself but why do you and and so many other people have such a a fascination with with books why why where did this passion come from you know why do you think you've you have this gentle madness it's just something that i've always had um uh, connection you know a quest for knowledge um <clears throat> i didn't have the benefit of, of knowing plato or socrates but on a certain level, I feel I know them because the books have survived. Mm -hmm. Or Aristotle, or Mullah Sadra, or Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, who's very dear to me also, or Ibn Sina, or Suharwardi, or Ibn al-Arabi, these great people, and I can sit in this room, and they're all here. Mm -hmm. And I can communicate with him in some way. And so the great ideas and the great teachings of the sages of the past are transmitted in writing. Uh, they're also transmitted in other ways, in the kind of living tradition. Yeah, in a way, they never really died, it seems. They never really died. No. So uh, there's an interesting passage, in fact, that speaks to that uh, in Alberto Mangal's book, The Library at Night. It's uh, just the foreword. And he says there that libraries, whether my own or shared with the greater reading public, have always seemed to me pleasantly mad places. And for as long as I can remember, I've been seduced by their labyrinthine logic, which suggests that reason, if not art, rules over a cacophonous arrangement of books. Hmm. I feel an adventurous pleasure in losing myself among the crowded stacks superstitiously confident in my case it's not a superstition but he says superstitiously confident <laughs> that any established hierarchy of letters or numbers will lead me one day to a promised destination hmm. in my own case i have reached many a promised destination and pray to allah that i continue to do so for many years to come by the intercession of muhammad he goes on, books have long been instruments of the divinatory arts. Mm. A big library, that's in quotations, mused Northrop Fry in one of his many notebooks, and the quotation continues, really has the gift of tongues and vast potencies of telepathic communication, end quote. So there is... A deep kind of communication you can enter into, mm. telepathic if you like, with uh, anybody who's written a book from the past. And in my case, I'm concerned about you know very particular topics, so I can be in some strange way in telepathic communication with Proclus or with Nasir Khusro mm. um, or Ptolemy or Ptolemy for that matter, or of the pre-Islamic poet Shanfara. Mm. For example. So, books, I think really, and libraries are a profound part of the human experience. And digitization and the internet and all that isn't going to really... I think change anything it might for many people but there will always be perhaps a minority those who are devoted to books and old things and ancient wisdom some might say living in the past no i don't really think it's the past it's everything i don't think it's the past i think i think i, I don't think that uh, plato is part of the past mm. i don't think that ibn sina is part of the past yeah, i just don't think that I think that uh, these uh, books, these people, they, uh, they speak to you now. They speak to us now if we would but listen.